Well, hello, church history friends. My name is Barb Walden. Hello, everyone. I'm Peter Smith. And I'm Seth Bryant, and we're excited to welcome you to our final night of our Stories of the Scattered Saints Fall 2022 Lecture Series. Our online lecture series is not only a great way to learn about church history, it's also an opportunity to help support the preservation of Latter-day Saint heritage. That's absolutely right, Seth. And I am thrilled to share that our annual fall campaign began this week. And you, our friends in the audience, have the opportunity to be among the very first to give to our annual campaign. Donations received throughout the end of the year will support the ongoing maintenance and preservation of all five Community of Christ historic sites located in Kirtland, Ohio, Nauvoo in Plano, Illinois, Lamoni, Iowa, and Independence, Missouri. In addition, your generous gifts will help fund young adults serving in the Alma Blair Internship Program, a life-changing program for young adults serving at the Kirtland Temple and the Joseph Smith Historic Site. I was a young adult intern at both of those places, and I can certainly witness that it is a life-changing program. So giving to the fall campaign also supports our online programs like tonight's lecture, in addition to the winter book series and special events that we host throughout the year. So your generosity truly makes a difference, friends, and I hope you'll consider making a donation to the annual campaign. Even better, our awesome board of directors will match your donation for the first $15,000 in donations received. So that means if you give a $100 donation, they will make it $200. A $1,000 gift becomes $2,000 gifts to support the, the historic sites. How great is that? So if you're interested in supporting the ongoing preservation efforts at these significant places of Latter-day Saint heritage, follow the QR code that you see on the screen. Peter's also gonna drop an online donation link and mailing address into the chat for anyone who wishes to donate. So thank you, we really appreciate your continuing support. Yes, thank you, thank you. And in addition to the fall campaign, there are a few exciting church history events happening over the next few weeks. Our friends at Joseph Smith III's Liberty Hall will host their annual Christmas tea on Sunday, December 4th. Uh, the afternoon includes a number of musicians and choirs. Uh, they have a children's bell choir that will be sharing. There'll be stories with Joseph Smith III and even a visit from Santa Claus himself. So the Christmas tea will take place that day from two o'clock to 4.30. And if you're in the Lamoni area, I really hope you join our friends at Liberty Hall. Then on Friday, December 9th, our friends from the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association will host Joey Williams in a program that will focus on early hymns of the restoration. So this online program will feature six early Latter-day Saint hymns from Emma Smith's Kirtland Hymnal, and it'll also feature Harley Pratt's Manchester Hymnal, uh, hymns from that particular edition. So I hear there's also going to be a few Christmas hymns included with Joey's program, so I hope you're all able to make it. They'll have words appearing on the screen throughout that online program, so you can sing along with Joey and have a good, good time. The program is free, but you will need to register. And Peter will drop the link into the chat for those who wish to join us that Friday. It's gonna be a great program. And that, my friends, is it for today's announcement. I'll hand the spotlight over to you, Seth. All right. Our guest historian tonight is our friend, Steve Shields. Stephen L. Shields is a retired Community of Christ World Church appointee. He was a founding uh, president of the East Asia Mission Center and a leader of the church's work in Korea from 1996 to 2004. Steve is a past president of the John Whitmer Historical Association and is the president of the Royal Asiatic Society of Korea. He writes historical and op-ed columns for the Korea Times in Seoul. He's a high priest in Community of Christ and divides his time between Seoul and the United States. Welcome, Steve. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us this evening to talk about Divergent Paths of Community of Christ. Spotlight's all yours. Thanks very much, Seth. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, hopefully, I can share some things that might be 
interesting or new to what you're aware of. My uh, focus tonight will be on modern, sort of modern day uh, community of Christ divergent paths rather than the whole scope of 200 years. We'll only use 100 years and focus on community of Christ. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the background of my research, uh, talk about two uh, fractious eras, uh, R.C. Evans and the Supreme Direction of Control controversy uh, that emerged in the early part of the century, uh, 20th century, and then uh, 15 years of dissent between 1969 and 84, which then devolved into chaos. Um, <clears throat> when I was a teenager, my uh, family took a trip through the United States and we ended up at Kirtland Temple. And uh, the, uh, the tour was, in, in my opinion then, was rather devoid of of uh, substance. It talked about architectural features, and that's about it. But I picked up all the free pamphlets that were there and read through them, and uh, I, I was not a member of Community of Christ at the time. Uh, had a church history class back home in Utah, and we were required to do a term paper. And so my first term paper was on the RLDS church, as it was known then. And it developed into a little bit more of what became later Divergent Paths of the Restoration. A, a booklet in 1974, while I was a senior in high school, was published. And then the first edition of Divergent Paths was published in 1975. Um, so 19, uh, or 2021, a, a fifth edition ebook was published. And uh, in uh, just this current year in the summer, a fifth edition uh, in print was published by Signature Books. Um, so I've, I've spent the last 50 years of my life dealing with the divergent paths of the movement. I've done dozens of papers and presentations. Um, you've seen articles perhaps in the John Whitmer Historical Association Journal, Journal of Mormon History, Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, and uh, some other places. Um, so I want to talk about these two fractious periods. Uh, the first one was in the late 19 teens, early 20s. Uh, and uh, no, none of this comes, nothing happens in a vacuum. Uh, and so there's, there's kind of a, 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 a up, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, a lead in to finally a, a last straw sort of a, a moment. Uh, so the, the first one sort of began uh, in late in Joseph Smith III's life when he put both R.C. Evans and Fred M. Smith in as his counselors at the same time. Uh, they were both called and ordained at the same time. Uh, Evans was uh, in his early 20s, mid 20s. Uh, uh, Smith was the son, and uh, uh, when it became clear that Smith was going to become the next president of the church, Evans decided to leave the presidency, went to Canada as Bishop of Canada, and uh, uh, but he and he and Fred M. Smith had two very different views of church government. Uh, Evans was an absolute democratic approach. Uh, whereas Fred M. Smith uh, believed a more centralized administration would be helpful. And, and both, of those is, both of those positions were somewhat different from Joseph Smith III's, uh, where he had been kind of a pastor trying to bring all these different uh, competing voices together and uh, find some middle ground. He let the pages of the Herald be used for somewhat rather... Uh, open, uh, not, not somewhat, but very open debate, sometimes rather acerbic debate. Uh, but uh, Joseph Smith III felt like that was important to pulling this all together. The second one uh, came to a head in 1984 with uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 156, but it had been brewing for some years, uh, beginning uh, 
with the 1960s Basic Beliefs Committee that uh, revisited and looked at uh, what the church was pre preaching and believing and, and uh, how it was approaching all of that. Um, there's a lot to cover. Um, and we're going to have to just sprint through it all because we only have an hour to do everything. Uh, so Fred M's uh, new style, uh, things began happening in 1918 with the agreement of working harmony with the Church of Christ on the Temple lot, wherein church members from either body could simply transfer their membership without need for rebaptism or confirmation and also retain uh, recognized priesthood offices. Uh, in 1918, R.C. Evans started a new church in Toronto. Uh, he died in 21, uh, didn't live to see the, uh, what became known as Supreme Directional Control, but it was actually a committee uh, of members of the, well, it was the 12th First Presidency and Presiding Bishopric in 24. They suspended World Conference, decided not to have it that year, instead have this committee meeting. And they came up with this uh, memo called Concerning Church Government. And in the articles of that memo, there's a small uh, reference to supreme directional control of the first presidency. Uh, but um, then uh, 1925, a protesting movement becomes the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, thousands leave and hundreds flock to the Church of Christ temple lot. Church of Christ calls uh, uh, seven apostles for the first, they hadn't had apostles uh, for decades, and six of those seven apostles were former uh, RLDS high priests. Then the Church of Christ Temple Lot itself goes into a period of fragmentation, but that's another lecture. Uh, R.C. Evans was, after he left the presidency, the Bishop of Canada, and uh, was probably the most prominent missionary that the church had seen in a long time. He, uh, he was in control of the church at Toronto. He had uh, revival meetings where sometimes, you know, standing room only audiences would come to big theaters in Toronto. Um, they uh, ended up with about five or 600 members of the Toronto congregation and had two or three other congregations in outlying areas. Um, the, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Evans had been ordained an apostle in Community of Christ at age 21, then became a member of the First Presidency five years later. Um, and uh, when he got to Canada, he began to uh, basically baptize lots of new converts and uh, taught them his particular views of church government. And when, uh, when Fred M. Smith attended a conference in Toronto in uh, June of 1918, uh, he stripped Evans of his priesthood, uh, felt that he had been uh, out of line with the church teachings. And uh, the next day, Evans read a letter of resignation uh, of his church membership and walked out of the meeting with about 400 other people. Uh, he claimed an angelic visitation and the report of that visitation became resolution number one when the new church was organized on 9th of June, just a week later uh, in Toronto in 1918. They wanted to use just the Church of Jesus Christ, but the uh, government authorities said it was too generic, so it became the Church of Jesus Christ of the Christian Brotherhood. Uh, in short, the Church of the Christian Brotherhood was often commonly used. Um, they decided that the Bible alone was the valid scripture, and, uh, but had a strong belief in continuing revelation. They uh, bought a church building from the Quakers, remodeled it. Uh, it was on Maitland Street in Toronto. Uh, they sold it, in, and in 1957, uh, sold that building and built this new building, which you see here, uh, the architect's rendering of the new building. Ten years later, the church disbanded and uh, 
sold this building to Community of Christ. Uh, it's located in Willowdale and was for many years the Willowdale uh, Congregation of Community of Christ. Uh, my uh, good friend and, and former uh, retired colleague Ron Smith and his wife Claire were married in this building. Uh, so it uh, served Community of Christ for many years until it, the property was sold and uh, the building was torn down and replaced with, with something, uh, some other things. Um, so supreme directional control uh, <clears throat> was, uh, as I said, this result of this committee meeting. Um, and uh, there were uh, two or three points uh, that were important in that document. When the committee's meetings came to an end, um, the first presidency all agreed. Only uh, a majority of the 12 agreed, four were in opposition and the entire presiding bishopric were opposed. One of the members of the presiding bishopric was Israel A. Smith. Uh, so this was a big deal and it was really uh, uh, such a, uh, a shift in the paradigm. Uh, so by the time the 1925 General Conference came uh, to, be organ to uh, start, there had already been a vocal and well-organized protest movement led by Apostle T.W. Williams. Uh, so some of the key points in that uh, memo, there, the church was a theocratic democracy, not man-made. Um, uh, divine authority comes through the priesthood, and it's operative through common consent, agreement of, of the governed. Uh, God directs uh, through clearly indicated channels with recognized grades of uh, responsibility and authority. The supreme directional control of the church resting with the first presidency, who are the chief and first quorum of the church. Uh, the chief executives of the church should not be discredited in any way. And that was where the uh, arguments began. We are not Rome. <laughs> T.W. Williams and the protesting group was a huge movement. There were you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, two or three members of the Council of Twelve were part of that. And they all walked out of Community of Christ, left the church. And by April of 1925, uh, which was the same time the General Conference was going on, they uh, organized a full-blown church called the Church of Jesus Christ, and they built a building on Kansas Street, which uh, would have been about where the north wall of the temple sanctuary is. Somewhere right about in there was where that church building was located. Um, there may be a few people who might remember this building. Uh, it was used in later years as a community theater. Uh, there was a drama group that used it. It was finally taken down in the 60s because termites had just wreaked havoc with the, the wood. Uh, at the same time, Williams and his group were forming their own church. Several hundred people left and joined Church of Christ Temple Lot. Uh, and uh, the Community of Christ was devastated by the numbers who walked out over Fred M. Smith's management uh, proposal, which, which became uh, church law because the vote of the people who were left in conference uh, agreed to it. Um, um, the Church of Christ on the temple lot lasted, only had their heyday for about three years, four years, and then they split up and that became uh, uh, a rather large and diverse uh, uh, community of several churches that exist today. I'm not going to go into the articles or the agreement of working harmony uh, too much. It was a rather lengthy document of 20 or 30 points of agreement, um, but uh, it was later rescinded. 
uh, during all of this disruption uh, period. Um, during the Depression and uh, World War II years, there, there was not much happening at all in, in the way of uh, any disruption to the church. Uh, people in the United States, where the primary population uh, was located, were caught up in, in uh, economic issues. The church itself was caught up in serious economic issues. Um, and then uh, when the war uh, started, you know, everybody was involved in the war effort to some degree or another. Uh, so not a whole lot happened until the post-war uh, period <clears throat> when uh, uh, Chuck Naff and some others, uh, as they had uh, followed leads in the 1950s, uh, uh, Chuck Naff came to Asia and uh, was the, the founding, sort of the founding apostle of, of the church in Korea, the church in Japan, and the church in India uh, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, in all of that, uh, and many of you uh, probably uh, are familiar with some of the details of the story, uh, Neff's assessment of what the church was providing didn't fit with people in Asia because they didn't even know who Mormons were let alone why there would be a difference. And most of our literature of the time was, we're not the, you know, we're not the Mormons. We're, this is, you know, this is what they do and we don't agree with it. And uh, he said, we need a new approach. We need some, some kind of a message. Well, that evolved into what became the uh, uh, first of a series of um, seminars uh, by the uh, Joint Council of the 12 Presidency and Bishopric, where uh, Paul Jones and uh, others from St. Paul's Methodist Seminary came in and helped the leaders of the church evaluate uh, what, what were basic beliefs, what were essential beliefs, what, how to couch those uh, in terms that would fit uh, a more modern world, perhaps, is a way to say it. Uh, the uh, upshot of all that was a, a whole new uh, Sunday school curriculum was being designed and the messaging changed a lot from what people had been familiar with. And uh, the, the, one of the very first organized efforts uh, to, to tr we got to keep the old Jerusalem gospel was in 1969. Uh, called World Redemption out of Southern California. Uh, Barney Fuller was uh, the leading person of that. They published a newspaper and uh, advocated a return to this old Jerusalem gospel, which uh, is defined in terms of uh, 1930s and 40s RLDS beliefs rather than first century Christianity, in my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> so, World Redemption uh, starts up uh, with publishing a newspaper. They were, uh, you know, still members of the church. They, they hadn't left. They just said, we need to shift gears and go back to, to what we grew up with. Um, so uh, in Pasadena, California, uh, there was a, a congregation nearby in, in uh, uh, Burbank and uh, Community of Christ Congregation. And they uh, were just interpreting the scriptures uh, in the old way and wanted people to, to be aware of that and advocate for that. And so they, they published this newspaper uh, for about six years called Zion's Warning. And uh, they published pamphlets, a, a, a full length book about the Book of Mormon. And uh, it uh, was suspended in April 1975, when uh, Barney Fuller and the others organized a church, the New Jerusalem Church of Jesus Christ, uh, it was headquartered in Independence. Um, uh, Fuller claimed revelation from God, and uh, they uh, uh, obtained a building, uh, which uh, is just on River Boulevard, uh, between just north of the uh, Waldo Avenue. Uh, church, if you're familiar with that geography and independence. 
Uh, they originally accepted only the inspired version of the Bible, the 1908 uh, edition of the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Commandments with some reservations. They got rid of the Doctrine and Covenants entirely. But within a year, they dropped everything but the uh, King James Version of the Bible and completely left anything to do with uh, the history of the church. Within a few months, the church fell apart because most people had joined it wanting to be somewhat in the tradition. Uh, in 1970, another Southern California church member in Van Nuys <coughs> um, began publishing the TLO newsletter called The Loyal Opposition. And uh, uh, he was uh, uh, trying to, uh, I, 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 I jumped ahead of my slides. I apologize for that. Um, uh, Post-war years, growth, uh, essays on basic beliefs, 1984 being the last straw, and then since 84, chaotic descent. Here's, here's uh, several of these in, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the, the key ones being uh, World Redemption, the TLO letter, uh, Paul Fischel and many members of the Vancouver, Washington Community of Christ Congregation, uh, Restoration Festival, and then some others there. And then 84, uh, just within days after the uh, uh, Section 156 was adopted by the conference was Lee Abramson's church. Um, uh, Howard Liggett, who was publishing the Loyal Opposition newsletter, uh, was not advocating a new church. He just said, uh, the apostasy has happened at the top. We need to reform the church. We need to uh, go back to the, uh, the old style. Uh, in, in Vancouver, Washington, uh, Paul Fischel, and uh, I believe he was pastor of the congregation at Vancouver and others, uh, basically formed in, in March of 1977, the first what we now call Restoration Branch. Um, and they organized uh, in opposition to the church. They were locked out of the church building by the regional administrator at the time. And uh, they ended up building their own building. And uh, uh, official was uh, banned from ministry. Uh, he he was at oh he was he wasn't the pastor he was he was a an evangelist at the time when all this happened so he was a senior member of the branch and uh, they ended up building their own uh, building and uh, uh, they had fifty people in the beginning and by uh, 1988 they had more than a hundred uh, so it was a significant early uh, restoration branch. Uh, they, uh, they had to incorporate uh, in, by law to uh, own property. Um, and uh, so they uh, uh, basically formed a model for many other restoration branches that uh, sprung up in the years after that. Uh, official declared that they firmly believe in the church organized by Joseph Smith and five others. Um, we continue to register our newly baptized members with the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, it wasn't too long ago in 77, the church headquarters said, no, we, we don't recognize your priesthood. We're not going to register those baptisms. Um, they had no plan to set up 12 apostles or a prophet and uh, continued for many, many years as an independent branch. Uh, Restoration Festival, some of you may... Uh, be aware of uh, Greg Donovan uh, from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, they, they held a, uh, a meeting, uh, a sort of a reunion at Graceland University in uh, September of 1978. They had 2,500 people who attended and uh, had another one in uh, 1980. Uh, they organized the Restoration Festival Incorporated in 1979. And uh, we're arguing that uh, uh, the church uh, needed to return to its original mission and message. 
1984, they had a split in their festival organization and the Restoration Foundation was started uh, with almost identical goals, but a different set of leaders in each of the groups. Um, and uh, the Restoration Foundation had their own family camp and uh, uh, it was kind of the start of what I call the chaos. Um, Lee Abramson was a 70 in the church and uh, he and others at Beals, Maine organized an independent uh, congregation in 1984 and uh, they uh, again, had to incorporate because the law requires that for holding property and receiving tithing and things. Uh, and then several other branches were organized that all kind of had affiliation with, with the Bill's main group and uh, advocated, <clears throat> Abramson advocated separation from Community of Christ, unlike many of the restoration branches who were uh, emerging at the time. Uh, and uh, some of them have asserted that Community of Christ under its old name is still the church and we need to reform the church and have new leaders without setting up a new church. And uh, Abramson said, no, it's, it's, it's too late. Uh, so the Church of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was organized and continued for many years until Abrams, Abramson's death just, uh, well, maybe 10 years ago. One of the <clears throat> founding members of the quorum, first quorum of Restoration 70s um, uh, in 1989 was Norm Page. Abramson joined that group and uh, uh, Page brought forth a revelation dated September 9th, 89, calling for an organization of the quorum. Second revelation in 1990, directing the 70 to call a general assembly. And uh, in April of 91, they organized a new church. And at the time, uh, Abramson brought his group into that new church. Um, the, uh, uh, also, what was happening in 1984 was this international elders conference. Uh, a lot of things were happening in the wake of the 1984 World Conference. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this International Elders Conference was called, <clears throat> which, which was to discuss the uh, uh, state of the church and what ought to be done. Uh, they were all opposed to Section 156 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and uh, they contended that the church had departed from the distinctive teachings of the Restoration, and so they were to set the church in order. Um, uh, members of the Melchizedek priesthood only were allowed to come to the conference. Um, I don't know numbers, but it was maybe 40 or 50 people that got together in independence. Um, and they continued to have several meetings over the next couple of years. During one of those meetings, uh, uh, Dennis Cato was elected as the chairman, and uh, they he he brought forth the uh, he invited his uh, uh, father to speak, and the father basically John uh, declared that he'd been called as prophet and uh, presented a revelation. And uh, they spent an afternoon and evening of considering this new development. The elders voted not to sustain Cato's revelation. Uh, Dennis Cato resigned as conference chair and a number of the steering committee left and uh, organized the Church of Jesus Christ Zion's branch uh, in, in 1985. Cato, uh, John Cato continued to issue several revelations, but uh, within a couple of years, uh, the Cato's, uh, completely rejected uh, all of that and uh, became members of the LDS church and uh, 
Dennis Cato served for a number of years as the independent state president. Uh, the family became very uh, faithful and loyal members of the LDS church. Uh, their uh, church that they had organized, um, I think kind of dwindled. I noticed when I was in independence two months ago for the John Whitmer Historical Association meetings that their building uh, had been sold. And uh, it was located on Pleasant, uh, just, just east of uh, the Community of Christ Temple. The Restored Church of Jesus Christ was organized also in 1984. And it was in Australia, in uh, Queensland. Norman Melling was the uh, chief uh, leader of that group. They used the Doctrine and Covenants through Section 155, Book of Mormon in addition to the Bible. Uh, they were registered as a nonprofit organization, but did not have a profit. The corporation had to have a president and treasurer. Um, but uh, uh, Norm Melling was the uh, president of the corporation as of 2008. Luke Melling was the pastor of the congregation. Um, they had a, a rather well organized and well stated. Uh, Point of uh, points of belief had a pretty good website, but the website since disappeared, and I've not been able to uh, track them down at all. Uh, in 1986, the first uh, effort at getting all these different branches organized into some sort of a fellowship was started, and uh, it was not long lasting. Frank Utterback was one of the key movers. Uh, and uh, you know, all of the issues in this whole section of what was happening in the 80s and 90s into the present time revolved around the new curriculum that was started in the 60s and this new approach to what the church, how the church was defining itself and the ordination of women, uh, which they saw as an outgrowth of this change in the message. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I don't know exactly how long the Association of Restoration Branches lasted. It wasn't too long, uh, two or three years maybe, uh, and it was replaced later by the Conference of Restoration Elders, which was able to pull together a pretty, uh, pretty well-organized effort. Um, in 1987, uh, Leroy uh, Ormsby up in Michigan and others founded the Church of Christ Restored, and they modeled uh, their whole organization on what Paul Fischel's group had done uh, in the 70s in Vancouver. Um, and, uh, but they continued as a, uh, the Church of Christ Restored continued as an organization for about 20 years. Uh, they uh, called uh, apostles and uh, had a quorum of apostles. Um, they, uh, several of them had been part of uh, the uh, International Elders Conference, but uh, were dissatisfied with the outcome there. And uh, uh, they had an article of Articles of Faith, uh, which looked very much like uh, the 1842 statement by Joseph Smith Jr. Uh, and uh, in uh, more recent years, uh, they, they ceased publishing their, uh, their uh, bi-monthly newsletter in uh, 2012. By 2019, most of their leaders were involved with uh, Joseph Smith, who was formerly a Community of Christ member in his new organization called the Restructured Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, in 89, the first quorum of Restoration 70s, as I mentioned a little bit earlier with Abramson, Page, and uh, Marcus Juby was organized and uh, uh, called for a reorganization of the church uh, based on Page's revelations. In 1991, they held a conference and uh, the Restoration Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was founded with Marcus Juby as the prophet and Doyle Lanius as the presiding bishop. Page was um, involved in that as the evangelist, and uh, they had a full uh, quorum of 12 apostles eventually. 
and uh, worked for several years until Royal Lanius and uh, Juby kind of got at odds with things. Lanius and one of the apostles, Jack Ferguson, who some might recall from uh, being the, the managing director of Herald House back in the day, uh, organized the World Church of Jesus Christ and uh, basically ran some interference against Juby um, and his group, uh, the World Church of Jesus Christ, uh, bought the one of the old uh, elementary schools in Independence in the old part of town, which is now uh, part of the health department. Um, they used that school as their headquarters. Um, like, like many of the organizations in our movement and others, uh, there's always a large following in India and Africa, uh, which evaporates when the money evaporates. Uh, I've been uh, in a couple of our churches in India where the pastors uh, had been ordained by a group from Canada, then ordained by World Church of Jesus Christ, and now we're ostensibly Community of Christ people. Uh, it's an interesting history all in itself. Um, the, uh, the Restoration Church lost Marcus Juby um, in, the, in the early 2000s. He was replaced by several uh, other uh, successors over that since that time. Um, uh, Juby resigned in, in July of 2001. He said he had irreconcilable differences between himself and the members of the 12. And uh, uh, so he and some of the others organized uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Israel, which lasted for only a short time. Uh, Juby died in 2004, maybe. I, I can't put my finger exactly on the date that he passed away. Um, so the first quorum of Restoration 70s evolved into two different organizations. And then another quorum of Restoration 70 was founded in 1991. Uh, and uh, in 2005, they emerged uh, and became the Conference of Restoration Branches or the Joint Conference of Restoration Branches as they're sometimes called. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this uh, this quorum of Restoration 70 was led by Frank Fry, Richard Neal, Neil Simmons, and, and I'm going to get his last name wrong because I don't know how to pronounce it, Ernest Rao, R-A-U-H. Uh, they were all 70s in, in Community of Christ RLDS Church at one time, and uh, uh, they uh, declared that uh, they're the, they're the only authorized quorum of 70s for all the restoration branches. It's a good self-declaration and it's a nice uh, romantic view. Uh, but uh, in, in 2005, that group uh, uh, started what is called this Conference of Restoration Branches. And uh, they've proceeded and organized uh, at least as far as uh, Council of 12 Apostles, Quorum of 12 Apostles. Um, they argued that they were not a new church, but, but a, a reformation of the uh, RLDS church. And uh, they've had uh, several of their people uh, have issued revelations, not as the prophet, but as prophetic guidance. In uh, 2008, three of their members, Vern Darling, Rob Rolfe, and Doug Smith, uh, were called to uh, visit Wallace B. Smith, who was then by then president emeritus of Community of Christ, uh, and ask him to appoint someone to be the prophet and president for their organization. Uh, Smith, uh, I'm told, did not accept their invitation to uh, do that. Um, so Neil Simmons has been uh, uh, was one of the first uh, apostles in the group. Uh, uh, Steve DeVera, uh, Ron Smith, who taught at Graceland University, uh, mathematics, I think. Uh, they've all become apostles now uh, in the church. Uh, not all the branches of the Restoration Branch movement has joined with them. There's still quite a large gathering of uh, Conference of Restoration 
elders who advocate not organizing a church. Um, so it, uh, it goes on. They've got uh, a headquarters building on uh, Truman Avenue in Independence. They publish a, a magazine uh, bi-monthly, I believe it is. Uh, the Conference of Restoration Elders is by far the best organized and uh, most uh, prolific of the uh, groups and branches that came out of the, the whole uh, 1984 last straw event. Um, Dave Bowerman, who had been head of the uh, RLDS real estate department, was the key uh, mover and founder of the Conference of Restoration Elders. And since 1992, they've continued now 30 years uh, as a fairly well-organized um, fellowship. They uh, are not a denomination in their way of looking at it. They do uh, centralized uh, record keeping of baptisms and, and ordinations. Um, but uh, they've, they've always affirmed uh, the Doctrine and Covenants through Section 144, Ezra Lay Smith's last one. Uh, they uh, also uh, affirmed uh, several conference resolutions from RLDS Community of Christ that had been adapted, uh, adopted uh, up to the time they organized. Um, they, uh, they've worked hard to avoid setting up a new uh, branch, uh, a new uh, denomination. The uh, branches don't join. They just look to the conference for administrative and fellowship support. They provide some publication of curriculum and uh, uh, meetings of uh, different uh, priesthood quorums like evangelists and so on. Um, in recent years, uh, the, uh, Richard Neal is been giving revelations to the conference and uh, uh, suggesting that they separate themselves. So there we may see a denomination emerging from that. One denomination that did emerge out of uh, Conference of Restoration Elders in 1999 is the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. First uh, president of that was uh, Fred Larson. Dave Bowerman was the key uh, organizer of this new denomination, and uh, they continue now uh, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, 20 some years later. Um, after uh, Fred uh, Larson passed away a couple of years ago, a uh, uh, new president of the church by the name of uh, Terry Patience was ordained and uh, Patience claims Smith family connections, but through a long ago, met gener uh, many generation ago, ancestor of Joseph Smith Jr. Uh, but when, uh, when they had the conference to ordain him, uh, there was a disruption in that church uh, because up until that moment, uh, Jim Von Cannon was understood to become the successor to Fred M. And so he and his folks organized a separate church called the Everlasting Church of Jesus Christ in the Latter Days in 2019. Um, that's pretty chaotic presentation to you, as well as the chaos that is, it, 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 it's the same number of people that we started with in 1984, broken into ever smaller, smaller groups. Uh, who are completely in disunity. Uh, on the left is the Remnant Church headquarters, which is the old Christmas High School building. Uh, in the bottom center is the Restoration Church of Jesus Christ, which is uh, on 23 Highway, just uh, south of, of uh, the temple. Uh, it's an old school building that they remodeled. Uh, the right hand is the uh, former building of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ Science branch. Um, in both cases, the church, Community of Christ, RLDS, lost uh, significant numbers of members. Uh, as much as 10% of the total membership in each of those two periods of, of uh, fracture. Uh, there is no other denomination in the movement uh, 
that has had as many people leave and start new organizations. Not even the LDS church has had that many in numbers <laughs> or close to the percentages. Um, and the LDS church is 60 times larger, which one might expect to see more of that. Although there's dozens more groups, uh, the total numbers compared to total membership is rather small. Uh, I think uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that Community of Christ has always been a very, uh, has always been very open to debate, uh, has been generally uh, uh, willing to accept people uh, who have different opinions, different viewpoints. Uh, you have to be really, really off doing some things before you get uh, discipline disciplined by the church courts, which happens so infrequently, it's, I don't think anybody can put their hands on the church court handbook, uh, because there's so few copies. Um, Joseph Smith III, as I mentioned earlier, let the pages of the Herald be open for debate. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, I say we because I'm a member of Community of Christ. Uh, I think we've always been open to the leadings of the spirit, whatever you interpret that. And, and uh, we've worked really hard the last several decades to not get ourselves so set in, in a concrete system that we can't adapt and change and modify to try and meet the needs of people in the world and people in our fellowship. Um, even the evolution of the church name, you know, is kind of a, a slight hint to that. Uh, when, when we first started, after the disruption at Nauvoo, we were simply called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's what the church had been called at Nauvoo. Uh, and it wasn't until 1872 that we formally added the word reorganized in front of that. And then, as most of you would, would be uh, present uh, in 2001 when we changed to Community of Christ, uh, in a way to try and get back to our original roots in some way of speaking to help set an identity that might be a little bit different. Um, and uh, those are all things that sort of point to what I think has, has been, has laid the kind of a, a fertile seedbed for uh, all of this uh, fractiousness or fissiparousness, as it's called in formal terms. Uh, we're called to seek, and that's, uh, you know, uh, we have lots of people seeking, and we don't always find the same things. So uh, there we have it, and uh, I'll make an end of my ramblings. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to entertain questions if there are any. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and uh, research, many, many years of research with us tonight. Now, friends, if you want to learn more about what Steve has shared this evening, I encourage you to pick up his new book from Signature Books, Divergent Paths of the Restoration, an Encyclopedia of the Smith-Rigdon Movement. The book is available in both ebook and a two-volume paperback edition. Tonight, we're going to end and with just a few closing remarks. Unfortunately, we lost Seth due to some heavy, heavy winds in Kirtland, Ohio. Um, but I do want to thank again, uh, Steve, for joining us this evening and for sharing with us. And thank you all in the audience for attending this evening's lecture and attending throughout the fall lecture series. We have learned a lot of church history along the way and look forward to learning even more in the new year. In fact, we are going to carry the, the theme, the stories of the scattered saints into the spring lecture series next year. Uh, Vicki Speak will give her lecture called Polygamy Visions and Power, How the Strangites Became RLDS. She'll share that in the spring lecture series. And Amy De Rogatis will share her lecture, Charlie's a Gal, James Jesse Strang's first plural wife, Elvira Eliza Field. So we're gonna begin with the Strangites and explore even more Scattered Saints groups uh, in the spring lecture series. We will keep you posted on the other lectures and more through our websites, through the email flyers that we send out and through social media. And we wouldn't be able to host these online programs without your generosity, friends. 
thank you so much for your generous support throughout the year, uh, helping preserve and maintain Community of Christ historic sites. Thank you, thank you. So until next time, keep reading your church history and have a warm and wonderful Thanksgiving and Advent season. <laughs>